OK, um, my name is Irrelevant, but you can call me David if you meet me out there. Because it's not about me. Although I am actually, funnily enough, unusually for my, one of my talks, I am going to talk quite a bit about my own journey. But I'm going to do it in such a way that hopefully you'll relate to uh, quite a lot of it. So today's theme is Authenticity, subtitled The Art of Being Real or Your True Self in a Fake Make-Believe World. And, and I know that in the blurb, it, it mentions that I'm going to in particular talk about the six universal truths. Well, I've got a confession to make. I could only remember five. <laughs> so there's the authenticity, isn't it? I've owned up. Yeah? Thank you very much. And I love these campsites. I mean, it's amazing. Isn't it? People, you rock up and they assume that you've just set up your tent and they say, are you all set? I said, yeah, room 34 at the Belfry. <laughs> because an authentic camper doesn't camp because this is not a camping country. I would camp in a, in a nice template, you know, temperate climate, but I would, not here. It's rheumatoid arthritis territory. You know, just forget it. Just get on with your life is what I tell myself as, I, as I'm shaving in the morning. Right. And oh, and the, the um, thunder boxes, as we used to call them at school camp, you open up and you think, holy shit, either someone's doing a major detox, detox or there's a horse on the loose. <laughs> and then you do what you've got to do and you realise that you're the horse because it's all going down in one pile, isn't it? It's like, you know, anyway, I'm digressing now. What I'm doing, for those of you who know these little tips, tricks and hacks, is just blabbing while people just filter in, you know, because they may go to something else and decide, no, this is not for me. I'll go and see what that random guy in the oak marquee is talking about. Some of you may know me as the people's lawyer, but I'm not here to talk about law. As I said, I'm here to talk about authenticity. Now, I'm going to ask some questions. I'm going to give you something to think about. But the questions relate back to my experience of life. What do you think at the age of, I was about 23, and I was asking my employer, because I wanted him to sign a competence form that would qualify me as a solicitor. I'd done the training, and he said, there you go, you effing C. So that was 23. He's a senior partner in a form of solicitor. So... What made him say, you effing see? Um, and then about a year later, maybe less than a year later, um, I was in the doctor's surgery and I had symptoms of stress, stomach cramps and what have you. And he offered me pills and a pres prescription for pills. And I said, I'm 23. Are you kidding me? What made me say that? And then about 10 years ago, I started writing a book called School No Place for Children, which is now published, self-published, but it's published. What made me write a book called School No Place for Children? And then about two years ago, during lockdown, I was in Wales and I went into the shop and she said, uh, there was a shop in a village in Wales and she said, Sorry, sir, you can't come in without a mask. You've got to wear a mask. And I said, uh, no can do. She said, why not? And I said, it's against the law. And she looked very confused. What did I mean when I said it's against the law? So those are four questions that I need you to think about. Well, I said, I don't need. I, I, I'm, I practice non-attachment. don't need anything. If you so choose... Think about those questions. So I'll repeat them. What made my boss say when I was asking him to sign my competence to be a solicitor? Here you go, you effing C. What made the doctor offer me pills when I was 23 year old and me say, are you kidding me? I'm 23. Why are you offering me pills? What made me start off and complete a project which came, which became the book known as School. Where is it? Yeah, yeah. School, no place for children. I, I catch myself off guard. I think sometimes I actually gaslight myself. You know, I sort of say, 
six universal truths. Sorry, I've only got five, you know. Um, and what made uh, me say to that assistant in a shop in Wales, no, not wearing a mask, it's against the law. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you these f five universal truths to throw into the mix. And I'm going to give you a potted version of, of, a, of a young baby, boy, young man, middle-aged man, whatever, going through the motions of being his true self and, and the ups and downs of someone doing that. And relate that to your life. And, and then we'll tie it all together towards the end with the universal truths. And if there's time, we'll do a bit of a Q&A. Right, so the universal truths. You are an eternal being having a t transient human experience. You are at cause in your life. Nothing happens to you without your intention. Nothing without having set your intention. Now, you may not have done it consciously in this lifetime. It could have been unconsciously in this lifetime or consciously in another lifetime. It gets a bit involved. You are all that is. You are connected to all that, uh, all that is. All that is is in you and you are in all that is. That's three truths. The only constant is change. So immediately we can see that people who don't like change are going to struggle because change is the only constant. And the fifth truth, what you put out, you get back. So there's a lot of personal responsibility in those universal truths. There's a lot of power and personal responsibility in those truths. And you can see that particularly people who've been through the schooling system have they've dropped off that that table of truths yeah and now i'm not here to go in into much depth at all about that because that's my other talk which is you know the schooling apocalypse i'm now renaming it just to give it a more dramatic title so let's go through my potted history so um a few decades ago it's more than a few decades ago i landed on this planet and when you're a, when your spirit becoming matter you see things that you don't see when once you've landed. So I looked down and I saw my parents and I think, oh, might have a few problems here because he doesn't love himself and she doesn't love herself and therefore they can't love each other. But, fuck okay, it, I need to land somewhere. <laughs> so I landed anyway. And so I became the illegitimate child of an illegitimate couple. I use that term very, very loosely. Not le it's not a legal term, it's a universal term, you know? There's, there's no authenticity in their relationship. I ah, see where I'm going with this. But I landed anyway. Hold that thought. And then, a few years later, they send me off to school and I meet this young lad. Now, I'm a bit of a, I've developed a, a light-hearted approach to life, maybe to cope with the fact that I'd landed into an inauthentic triangle. And I'm clowning at school, and I found, find myself in the same class as a, as a fellow clown. And we have the most amazing year of clowning. But at the end of that year, it was year four, they used to call it, eight then or some year eight meaning eight year olds but it was year call it year four now second year of elementary primary we had such fun that life was you know all the previous sort of like question marks i'd had about my existence because of landing in an illegitimate relation it, everything was resolved life was fun we were having a giggle every pretty much every day at the end of that academic year, they, they, there was a meeting behind closed doors and we got separated. So this authentic clowning, because that's what we are, that's what kids do, they, they clown around, they have a giggle, was stamped out at the age of eight. So that was my second major existential lesson, you know, that if you are seen to be having too much fun, somebody somewhere will 
come down on you like a ton of bricks. <clears throat> it possibly explains why my boss 20 years later or 15 years later called me an effing C. So, I decided that rather than beat them, I would have to join them. So, I thought if they're going to deprive me of fun, I'm going to play the game their way, which is the academic game. And I've since learnt that academic defines as, anyone been to my talk, you'll, you'll know what it defines as, Jane does. Academic, definition two in the Oxford English Dictionary. Academic defines as, of no practical use or value. <laughs> now, if I'd have known that, uh, then what I know now, I probably would have taken another route. I'd have probably joined a circus. <laughs> but I didn't know then what I know now, so I put my head down and studied, and I excelled. I was a good student, because it kept me away from this illegitimate couple that referred to themselves as mum and dad. And it kept me out of trouble at school from the authorities. And so life was kind of tolerable, kind of. And it got me a career eventually. Well, actually, before it got me a career, it got me to graduate. And I've since found out that, and I've learned this very late, considering what I do, I'm, I'm almost ashamed of myself. Graduate comes, the etymology of graduate comes from two words gradually and indoctrinate just swallow that one with your porridge oats and soya milk so I'm now being gradually indoctrinated but I don't know that because I'm too young and I haven't done the dictionary work and I do well I get my graduate put my mortarboard on more to board, more is death as in mortgage, board, B-O-R-E-D, died of boredom while being gradually indoctrinated. The cabal tell us what they're doing all the time, but we're just too effing stupid and hypnotised and brainwashed and sidetracked and distracted, to be fair. That's the most compassionate thing I can say, really, and it applies to all of us. We're too sidetracked. And that's the delicious evil of the cabal. They make sure that we're sidetracked so we've never, never got the time or the energy to find out what we really need to know, which produces nescience. Another word that never crops up. There's two words that don't crop up in uh, education. One is nescience, and now one is propaganda. The kids of today are telling me, when I ask them, do you know the word propaganda? None of them have heard of the word. So, yeah, all these key words are being taken out of the uh, agenda, the curriculum agenda. So, I've been gradually indoctrinated and I've got my um, symbol of being bored to death. And so, the reward for that, so that's the stick. Now, the carrot is the career. And I've since found out that career can be a verb and when you're careering, you are losing control. So, I don't know any of this then, but I'm just, I think I'm, I'm, think I'm on a major journey upwards somewhere. I've no idea where, but it's, it's upwards, that's all I know. And then I find myself in an office where I don't quite fit in. So, for example, trainee solicitor's office, everything is micromanaged. That's why they send you to school, so you can learn to micromanage your time. And two young men end up getting arrested for failure to appear on, I think it was at a police station or in court, I can't remember, because I'm looking after them, but they've gone on holiday and I've not put it in my diary. Because the authentic me doesn't micromanage his time. But I'm in a non-authentic environment, but I'm not compromising. So in the end, I get called the effing C and, and I'm out of the legal profession. I did get back in briefly because what happened next was I joined the, um, the Fresh Air Brigade delivering parcels. Not delivering fresh air, but delivering parcels. So I was out on the streets of London working for a subby, subcontracted to a big parcel delivery firm delivering parcels. And because I was now in a far more authentic environment, just very simple, you know, driving as fast as I can without knocking anyone down, 
learning my way around London and delivering parcels. And I was as happy as Larry because nobody was, you know, was pecking my head. Nobody. Now, funnily enough, 40 years later, they would be because they've got a spy in the, in the cab. So they would be pecking your head. Every delivery is micromanaged and ordered to the nearest 30 seconds, maybe one minute. But back in the day, if you were a very, very good map reader and very quick, quick learner, you could arrange it so you could finish early and get an extra round. Anyway, so I was so happy being out of an office and breathing fresh air, if you can call London air fresh air, that one day I got up at five in the morning, went into a depot, six in the morning, and I've got this big beaming smile. I'm still in my mid-twenties. And there's these morose depot workers loading boxes because they haven't been where I've been. They haven't had the privileges or whatever. So this is all they know. And they, one of them comes over to me. He says, come here. So what's up? He says, just come here. And he puts his arm around my shoulder and he says, whatever you're on, <laughs> I want some. <laughs> and I said, I'm not on anything. I said, I'm just happy to be delivering parcels. He just wouldn't have it. He said, you can't be. He said, look, I won't tell anyone, but, you know, if, if it's something special, you know, just between me and you, but I want some. I said, I, no, not anything. Just on life. So, the thrill of breathing London fresh air, <coughs> right, wore off, and I ended up, hearing the call or listening to the call of Spain. Because at school, one of the things I didn't tell you, because I do a, I'm, I'm working on a need to know basis right now, was that I did languages. So I'm a linguist, amongst other things. Uh, but my languages didn't extend to Spanish, it was French and German. So I thought, right, I've got to get out to Spain. I'm now pushing 30. I don't know, how, how can you push 30, by the way? How do you push? an age, right? Anyway, so I decided to get out to Spain to improve. I'd already started self-educating in Spanish, but to improve my Spanish, live a different life, see what happens, get away from Thatcherite Britain. So I'd go out there and for two years I can survive off my savings. My granddad had died and I'd saved up from all this uh, parcel deliveries. And, and I was able to do a little sabbatical and, and accelerate my Spanish, Spanish language learning. And then money runs out, so you've got to work. So what can you do when you're in a foreign country? Well, teach your language because it's the world's business language. So I start teaching English as a foreign language and I get these students coming in all boasting of all their certificates. Oh yes, I have, uh, I have advanced English competence, uh, right? <laughs> And uh, I can't do, funnily enough, even though, that's, 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 that's French. I, I did actually pass through France at one point. I, I, I struggle with a Spanish accent, I really do. I'm going to have to, uh, I, I'm not going to apologise, it's not sovereign to apologise, but just, just bear with me, give me another six months. It's ridiculous because I'm fluent in Spanish and yet I can't speak Spanglish. Don't get it. Maybe I should speak in Spanish and then just translate. Anyway, so... So all these Spanish students, and they're at night school, they call them uh, ac 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 academies, academias. They're all bra bragging about how many qualifications they have in English and how competent they are. But, it, but they don't understand a word I say, nor do I understand a word they say in my language. And I'm thinking, so I end up saying, well, who taught you English? Obviously, I don't want to upset them by telling them that they're, that they're clueless. I just, but I want to find out how, how they got to be so clueless. <laughs> so who taught you English? And this, uh, oh, it's beautiful, beautiful, na native Spanish. And it turns out, uh, that was Arabic, by the way, I think. Native, native, it was always native Spanish qualified English teachers. Yeah? Not Americans or Brits. Yeah, or Irish, or whatever. So they were getting their English from their own compatriots. And their own compatriots were getting paper qualifications. And remember, a qualification means that you have no competence. Yeah? 
qualified success is not quite as good as an actual success if you think about it, more wordplay so basically what I learned was that the Spanish language education system was a feedback loop congratulating itself but not actually teaching anyone or even better allowing or facilitating anyone to learn English because let's face it you can only learn English in England you can only learn American in America and I could only learn Spanish in Spain because I went to Spain having you know I was very cocky because I'd, I'd got fluent French and semi-fluent German I thought oh Spanish three weeks three months six months if I'm a bit busy took me six years six years to really get on top of it so people don't realize that because people have been given placebos all across the board whether it's law health education it's placebo effect and the biggest you know that's placebo isn't it yeah take this safe and effective take this language course safe and effective so we have an inauthentic system teaching inauthentic language but the teacher gets paid and the student gets a piece of paper after another year so after seven years i thought nope reached a glass ceiling time to come back so i went back to came back to this country and carried on the theme of teaching long story short i ended up teaching a card game called bridge or a simplified version of a card game called bridge which features in <laughs> hey school no place for children i should tell you what i should keep should keep yeah. keep it there <laughs> right and this card game allows boys and girls and men and women because it's played by grown-ups all over the world an authentic environment and one of the reasons why people are frightened of bridge they think of it as a tough game you know sort of highfalutin it's not if you can if you can concentrate and count to 40 you're in so i mind you in this day and age that's asking quite a lot isn't it to be quite honest so it's an authentic environment where you have to be yourself you can't be anybody else but yourself and that was a threat to the system because the boys and girls were reveling in an environment in which they were allowed to be themselves and make autonomous decisions free will choices get on fall out make up win lose feel react respond dynamic it's life card games when you're playing a card game you're you're living there are other ways to live but one thing i can tell you because i've been playing this game since i was 13 you're alive because you're thinking concentrating competing relating anyway so this authentic environment was seen as a threat to the system not immediately but eventually some schools it was very rare that a school embraced it one school in Leeds Micklefield I think took the game on and made it into an SEL in this country unless things have changed Sandy it's SEAL in this country SEL is America unless this country has adapted their terminology in my book it's SEAL social emotional aspects of learning but in America it's social and emotional learning yeah so wherever the terminology it's the same thing uh, so this school in Leeds decided that it would be ideal for social and emotional learning or social and emotional aspects of learning as it was then maybe it's changed um, and and I thought oh hallelujah this could be the start of something big it was the start of something very small And I, because originally the remit was to go in and give kids thinking and math skills, but one teacher said to me one day, there's no math, well, where's the maths in Bridge? And I thought, yeah, you're right, there's, there's nothing. So it's all about focus, concentration, logical thinking, lateral thinking, inferential thinking, getting on, falling out, blah, 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 communication. Anyway, so I wrote a report to my funders and said, why don't we shift the goalposts from thinking and counting skills to social and emotional stuff and long story short 
the, 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 that report found its way to Parliament and anything that finds its way to Parliament, well, it's like being cremated. It's, it's just going to go into a... <laughs> it's going to... Yeah, they've got a massive microwave that, that just burns documents. Yeah? Um, so, I thought, right, okay. So, I know I'm onto something here, but I'm being totally blocked. What can I do? So, I thought... I started writing my thoughts down on... on well, I was going to say on paper, but it was on a laptop. And that made it, and in the end, after about six months of doing that, it, it looked like a potential ebook. And then that, and then I showed that ebook to one or two people, and they said, "That's interesting. Keep going." So again, long story short, the ebook was released in 2015 with this title, and then two years later, after a lot more extensive research, it became a physical paperback, "School No Place for Children." And it felt more like a mission to get people out of school because what I'd seen was the level of tyranny and the level of dehumanization because if if you know that something is good for kids for their morale for their emotional and personal development and it's being blocked then it's not a it doesn't take a rocket science to draw the right conclusions that this system is anti-children and of course, just like the cabal and the agendas, the 2021, 2030, they have got... Now, this is the great deceiver, the great demon, whatever you want to call it, yeah? Um, it's the words. They, they own all these sweet words. They've owned them. They've hijacked them. So all the innocents out there, and that includes us sometimes, we get fooled into thinking just because someone is using amazing words that they're going to do amazing things with amazing intentions. But that's the great con. That's the great con. If someone is telling you over and over again how good they are to you, how amazing life will be with them or whatever, you can guarantee we're talking about psychopathy and narcissism. The lie has to be created and repeated to create a false, fake, inauthentic reality. Because real people don't need to open their mouths. They just do what they do. And when they're on a certain spiritual level, they just be. Yeah? So, be wary of the flowery, superficially attractive use of language, whether it's globalese, I'm currently writing a, a lexicon on globalese redefined. Um, it's not going to be a book. I don't think it's, it's going to be a, a, a booklet where I take their language and I re, redefine it so that we understand, so it accelerates our comprehension of what they're actually saying. There are many of us in the freedom movement who have already worked it out, but maybe not worked out absolutely everything and also need a convenient spot. That's, so that's... You know, I'll create a PDF and I'll plaster that everywhere. Um, so, inauthentic language. Be wary of that. Let me just keep tabs on where I'm going with this. Right, okay. Inauthentic people as well. So, what we've realised, and this is something I cover in, the, um, in my big education talk, the schooling system is cr is is on a conveyor belt basis, is churning out generation upon generation of inauthentic boys and girls. Yeah? They don't know who they are. They don't know where they are. I mean, when I was at school, I didn't know where I was. And I asked people in my talk, where were you when you were at school? And they go, oh, what do you mean? Some much smart I said, uh, Dover. No, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean ge geologically or geographically. Where were you when you were at school? And what I'm, the answer I give, and I can give it confidently because it was actually true, it's my lived experience. From the age of about 12 to the age of about 32, I was out of my body. Two decades spent out of my body. And I only realised that recently and it, it explains a lot of the experiences. So when you're out of your body, and that means that you float off, because when you die you float off and you keep floating. But when you're still alive, you float off. You, there's a point, you know, because that silver cord isn't broken. So it keeps you, but you're floating. Your soul floats off because you're under threat. You're under, yeah. And 
these vulnerable people, and they can be made even more vulnerable if they're specially gifted and talented, highly sensitive persons, dyslexics, good with their hands, good singers, good dancers, good sports people, because a lot of teachers are running an envy program. They say money is the root of all evil. It is not. It is envy is the root of all evil. Money was the, the result. Money was the outcome when envy was given a free run. Think about it. I'll, you, know, you can come and ask me more about it later, what, exactly what I mean. So, so the envy, and there's a section in the book where, uh, called um, Dream Stealers. So there's one teacher who meets a pupil 20 years later when 20 years earlier he had asked the, the kids for uh, a, report, uh, a, a summary of their dreams. What dreams do you have? And this particular boy said, well, when I'm old, I'm going to run a ranch because this is America. Uh, and the teacher absolutely gave him a, an F, which is fail. And the boy asked, why have, have you given me an F? And the teacher says, because that is not realistic. Give me something that I can mark. 20 years later, when he had his ranch, teacher stayed at the same ranch and said, I'm so sorry. I used to steal children's dreams. So there's all kinds of hidden dangers, traps and pitfalls in the schooling system. I could talk about them for 10 to 15 hours. And, don't you, and then people focus on the, on the bullying that you get in the playground. What happens is we've got collective amnesia. We've got collective amnesia. So if I, about two, four years ago, I asked a waitress randomly, how was school for you? She said, it was wonderful. And I said, are you sure? And she came back 10 minutes later. She said, oh, now that you asked me again. No, I'm not sure. It was horrendous. I don't know why I said it was wonderful. I must have been just thinking of my friends or the, you know, the friendships. The, the, um, the brain is kind to us. It doesn't dwell on the crap. And when it dwells on the crap, that's narcissism. So for the normal, whatever that means, person, we, we're, or the, let's say the healthier person, they move forward. They're not, they're not dwelling on the, you know? But all the narcissists out there are dwelling on all the hurts, grudges, lacks, insults, whatever, you know? And um, that's why they can bring something up after 20 years and you go, what the? Because hmm? um, that's what their, that's what that, that's their purpose in life. And your purpose is to show them forgiveness. But are they listening? No. Um, so, so this authentic card game, and all games, if you think about it, are authentic on some level, was given the elbow, the heave-ho. So, just as an idea of how you can turn things around, if life sends you lemonade, you make up, <laughs> make lemons. <laughs> life sends you lemons, make some lemonade. After the initial resentment wore off, I wrote a book and the book is doing okay. And it's going to do even better. Someone's offered to do an audio version and the audio version, well, I actually already have an audio, audio version, but the engineer has let me down and it's been sitting, gathering dust, if audios can gather, gather dust, for about 18 months. So anyway, uh, watch this space later this year. Hopefully we'll have an audio version out. Um, so, authenticity. So what have I learned on this journey? That um, when you are basically yourself, you will clash with the system, with agents of the system, and with the narcissist, psychopath, soci sociopath in your life who, who is threatened by your authenticity. Your very breathing is a threat to them. So I'm not advocating stop, stopping breathing when you're around narcissists, right? But just be very mindful. Someone, I was listening to someone on YouTube the other day, um, it's not something I was going to mention, but she said things that are quite common to narcissists in terms of what they say is you are overreacting. Mm. Yeah, the gaslighters. You're crazy. 
So in this, in, this, in this last three years, we've seen, first of all, how many narcissists are out there. And what my talks are all about is where potentially this is all being created. And I personally believe it's being created in the classroom. Why do I say that? Because in the classroom, you're not leading an authentic life. You are a hostage. You're a hostage. You were, you were sent there on when you were five, six or seven. You weren't told, and, you didn't, and if you were, you didn't understand why you were going there. Your parents or parent disappeared into the ether. You didn't know that you were ever going to see them again because it was your very first day at school. What's that called? Yeah, beginning with A. Abandonment. So we get abandoned at school and some people never recover from that abandonment. It's become normalised, so we don't talk about it. All these things that are normalised, you know, like narcissism, school qualifications, jobs, mortgages, whatever, we don't, we just take them for granted and we shouldn't. If we were being ourselves, we would question everything. And that's the other thing that schooling doesn't allow anymore. At this school, you can't, ask, you can't say no and you can't ask why. That's now a mantra of most schools. It used to be a mantra of the odd tyrant in school, but now it's pretty much all schools. So if you can't, ask no and you can't, uh, you can't say no and you can't ask why, what's the system doing to you? It's eroding your sovereignty. It needs you to leave school with a very low sense of self because it has plans for you and it has plans for your kids but even more importantly it has plans for your kids kids because if we do not stand up more than we are standing up and we are beginning to stand up but we need to stand up a lot more than we are standing up a lot more there's an awful lot of cowards in the so-called freedom movement who delegate the standing up to other people. Uh, sorry, I can't make it to the uh, Kent Resistance yellow board uh, outreach. Uh, I've got a bit of shopping to do, or I've got, uh, you know, I've got to take the grandkids to, you know? I don't give a shit. We're standing up for humanity. Some of the excuses people give are nothing less than pathetic. They want their old lives back. They're not going to get their old lives back. This is the new normal the new normal is the walls are closing in and we have to get stronger and stronger and stronger so that the walls stop at a certain point so you leave school with a very low sense of self and a very low sense of your potential which is why i call it narcissistic cynicism narcissism narcissism narcinics and the essence of narcissism is laziness Somebody else can do this, I can't be bothered. It's transactionality, so the narcissist will only do something if you make it worth their while. And since there are, since by my, by my reckoning, 90% of the freedom movement must be narcissists because they went to school, it means they're only going to get off their arse if you make it worth their while. Yeah? I'm not soft-soaping anything. This is hardcore, a hardcore wake-up call for those who think they're already awake. So we need to, if we're not a narcissist or we are beginning to control our narcissism, control in the sense of spot it, ah, no, no, that's, that's I've, I've got that from school. That habit, that terrible habit of compliance, of laziness, wanting something on a plate. I, I, I give courses and so many students, just give me the answer. You know, like at school, give me the answer, I've got a test to do. You know, and I, the first thing that I teach on my course is that you're the learner. I'm not teaching anything. And you're going to learn by reading information and formulating questions. So I do Zooms and the questioners are the students, they're not me. And when your sovereignty has been eroded, you've, you've stopped asking questions to re-inflate, to reignite your sovereignty and your power, start asking questions. Policeman rocks up, who are you? 
So then they start, what's your name? Who's asking? Because at school, you didn't dare defy this so-called pantomime authority figure. Well, you have to rewrite. You have to rewrite, and you can rewrite it. The beauty of humanity is that we can rewrite our own history. We can go back in time and we can tell the teacher, excuse me, miss, but who do you think you are? There's a girl, has anyone seen that clip just come out of a, she must be about 12, um, announcing to her teachers, she's, she's in the public square, literally, physically in a public square, it said Glasgow Memorial on the, and she goes to her, a message to my teachers, who do you think you are? Make, what makes you think your opinions matter? Yeah, I mean, why should a teacher be able to get up and say, hello, I'm Gail and I'm a lesbian? But miss, this is geography. <laughs> You've no idea, I'm, I'm sorry, but, no, I'm not sorry. It's just because you haven't been in school for so long, or we, we have no idea how bad it's got. And what I need, I don't have it today, but what I need is I need kids who are in school to sit there going, yeah, that's, that's real, that's, that's happening. And thankfully it does happen. So I've got, got very mixed feelings about kids being in school because they are the moles that I need. Yeah, that's happening because the, the grown-ups just don't believe me. Oh, you've not been to school for about 50 years. What the fuck do you know? Right? Well, I know. I've got informants. So we're dealing with a system that will basically crucify you. It's called menticide. Killing of the human spirit is not an official crime, but it's called menticide. There is a word for it. When you, when you make a boy or girl basically so desperate that on their last day at school, they will get together with other boys and girls and trash the entire school, which is somewhere reported me, uh, this to me the other day, then you know that, that uh, we're dealing with crimes against humanity. What would, what would make boys and girls of, who are leaving school want to absolutely trash the entire school? And that's what happens. They're now rioting in school. Because the thing about boys and girls is they are naturally authentic. See, I see what I did there? I'm piecing it back to... They're naturally authentic and they're being met with fakery. So I celebrate the rioting. I do have a remedy for classroom tyranny, which I'm not going to go into today, but it's a halfway house because my message is pull, because there are some very bad things about to happen, and they will b happen in the classroom, and it could involve sterilizing nasal sprays and sterilizing injections. So, since there is no positive reason to be in the classroom for your boy or girl or your grandson or granddaughter, and since you are now aware, if, if you weren't before, that there are some genocidal, eugenicistic agendas out there, why take the chance? So as I say in, in a whimsical kind of way, if the boy or girl is not old enough to go to school, then my mantra now is, it's safer to wait until they're at least 25. <laughs> That wasn't a gag, because at the, 20, at the age of 25, your brain is fully developed. You know what you want to learn. You know the difference between a narcissist, a uh, psychopath, sociopath, an empath. So if you're ready. You're ready to learn. And if you realise that it's all been a big error and it's, you don't fancy wearing a mortarboard and being gradually indoctrinated, you'll get the fuck out of there. 25 is the safe age to send a boy or girl to school. I know it sounds like a joke, but I mean it. I absolutely mean it. That's how serious and how bad it is. And if you don't believe me, just wait and see. Just wait and see. So this girl, I think she's, if anyone knows her, I think she's doing a talk at Le Leicester. There's an event at Leicester. I'm rearranging my schedule so I can get up there. Give her the book. Give her these, this classroom remedy. Um, and connect so that, because I don't have um, someone of that age speaking the way I speak. And that, because the kids, I've got no credibility amongst kids. 
I'm just a middle-aged fart who thinks he knows stuff that, you know? Because remember, one of the things of the narcissistic cynic, and that's what all the kids are being made into, is that they think they know best. They think their recently gained knowledge and their recently gained qualifications means that they know something that you don't. They know about climate crisis. Oh, summers were summers when you were a boy, but now, you know, we've got climate boiling. It's not even climate warming now, it's climate boiling. That was the you know, United Nations General Secretary. Climate boiling. So, so we are being majorly patronised by the kids. You know that, don't you? Yeah? You can't tell them anything. So everything is being inverted. Let's just have a brief look at what's going on, the bigger picture. Everything is being inverted. Yeah? Facts are lies, lies are truth. The elders know nothing. Back in the day, you looked to the elders for wisdom and inspiration. That's all changed. That's why, that's why Granny has committed suicide or died of heartbreak, because her wisdom has been discarded. Yes, it would have been nice to get a cuddle during lockdown, but the bottom line is not lack of cuddle, it's lack of value. Lack of value was the underlying, because I'm a terrain theory kind of guy, the underlying collapse of the system was lack of value. Value and valour, bravery, have the same root, val. So whoever, va so if there's a woman on campus called Val, we all need to befriend that woman. Because she has value and bravery. So these are the things that are going missing at a pace that is kind of scary. Value and, and courage and valour. So what am I doing? That's just a quick, quick time check. Oh, I think you get a 10 minute, okay. I'm three minutes away from my 10 minute warming, warning. Did I say 10 minute warming? Oh God. <laughs> 10 minute boiling, boiled frog syndrome. Right. Um, what am I doing? It's only fair to tell you what I'm doing. Uh, to, to me so you, I hope I've given you an idea that throughout my life, I've, you know, there was no career. My career in law lasted minutes, weeks, you know? My career at, at, in school teaching, not that I was a school teacher, but I was in schools, didn't last too long. So it's a story of failure through authenticity, which proves that you need to be fake to be successful. So really I'm living proof that only the, the fake succeed in clown world. And I'm here to give testimony to that that goes back <laughs> years. Sorry, just speech impediment just reared its ugly head. Um, what am I doing now that I consider to be more authentic? Well, I'm reporting, as well as reporting back from the trenches or from the front line, rather than being a solicitor who simply works to pay the rent or the mortgage or whatever, I'm now the people's lawyer who serves the community. I've gained a lot of knowledge and I'm passing it on. But I'm not passing it on in a patronising way, or at least I hope I'm not. I'm passing it on in a way that empowers so that people will take the knowledge and do stuff with it. And when people, it's a bit like when I, sometimes when I'm doing a bridge class, and, I've, and I have started doing that again in uh, home education hubs. Uh, David, what do I do now? They stick the hand up and I just say, why are you asking me? Well, you're the teacher, aren't you? Yes, but who's the student? Who's the learner? And in French, teaching and learning are the same verb. Apprendre is to learn and to teach. So you can't teach anyone anything. They can only learn and be inspired by you and maybe be guided by you. The learning takes place in your sleep. It's behaviour modification, it's thought modification. We learn in our sleep. We don't learn in any other way. <laughs> and we learn through repetition. So another thing that I would ask, what did you do repeatedly at school? And the answer is nothing to do with learning, it's to do with behaviour modification. Learning in the sense of learning stuff of value, because we know it was academic. So what did you do again and again and again? 
you said, yes, miss, yes, sir. No, miss, no, sir. You couldn't, answer, you couldn't ask questions, but you had to answer them. So now when you're asked a question, your immediate response, you immediately, you, your mouth is already opening. If you're asked a question by a so-called figure of authority, you're already answering, aren't you? You're already answering the question. And I get so many people who, who come to me way too late. They've already surrendered sovereignty because when you answer a question, you're also entering into contract. I'm not here to do law today, but I, I've got a touch on it. So the authentic sovereign picks and chooses which contracts they enter into. So I know it's on one level too late to go back to school. It's not too late to recover your sovereignty and authenticity from the rape. And I'm using dramatic language deliberately because that's what it was. It was mental rape, and now with the satanic agenda going insane, even the NSPCC are calling classroom antics, let's call them antics, as non-contact child sex abuse. And I don't like to dwell on the antics, because they're not mentioned in my book. I don't want to hit your eye on the satanic antics. I don't want to hit your eye that this book came out before COVID. don't want to hit your eye on anything. Because people could say, if I hitched a ride on that, first of all, I'm not being authentic. Secondly, if they stop doing their antics and stop doing their injections, people, it's all right, David, uh, coast is clear, it's safe to go to school. Oh, no, it fecking well isn't. So that's why someone suggested the other day, David, you need to update your book. No, I don't. To maintain its authenticity, the book stays as it is. <clears throat> so we've got some serious soul searching to do and another thing about the another reason that well another thing that um, suggests that I might be on the right track when, I, when I'm calling out the freedom movement or at least certain chunks of it is that it loves to accuse and blame well that's narcissism projection is narcissism Klaus Schwab this and Tony Blair that and that's not how you build a better world. Stop accusing. We need to stop accusing and we need to start soul searching to because we are the antidote but we're not going to be the antidote to anything if we're accusing because then we r lower our frequency down to their level because if you get to be able to see them you've got to go down you know like if you're looking up and you, do, oh right, I've got, I've got some accusing to do, you have to go down like this. Tony Blair, you're a, a homicidal, genocidal maniac. Well, vicariously, that now makes me a homicidal, genocidal maniac because I've taken on board that. One of the universal truths, I am only responsible for me. I'm only at cause for me. I'm not at cause for Tony Blair or Klaus Schwab or Bill Gates or Anthony Fauci or witty Professor Chris. Delete where applicable. I'm not at cause for them. What they think about life, what they think about anything is none of my business. So I never did a lockdown. I didn't do, just for two days, I wondered what they meant by coronavirus. I just, I didn't know. I hadn't r deeply researched terrain reality. It's not even terrain theory, it's terrain reality. It took me two days of, you know, I'm on the Manchester Metrolink doing this, March 20, 20th of 2020. That's a lot of 20s, right? And um, two days. And then after I'd researched it, I thought, this is a load of bollocks. And then life back to normal. <coughs> I had Manchester to myself. Well, I did. So I took up, I thought, well, I'm, I need to rally the troops. It's hard back in the day because everybody was scared to death. Even the so-called, even the freedom lovers didn't realise what was going on. They were, they were scared. No one was coming out. So I'd have, my first audiences were a man and a dog. And, you know, it was, and not only was the man abusive, but sometimes so was the dog. 
Dogs don't tend to like me too much. They, you know, I don't know what it is. Like. Cats like me, but dogs don't. Anyway, so, um, so there was a lot of people who had not worked out what was going on, heard me and thought, this guy's dangerous. This guy's a nutter. This guy's dangerous. This, but all I was being was a guy with a microphone who was telling people what he had learnt through researching more deeply. That's all I was doing. And on the rare occasions, because in the north, you, you always take a chance when you open your mouth in the north. Where are we? Stra where, where are we? We're sort of near Bristol. Yeah, OK. South enough to be south. So just as a tip for those who fancy the idea of speaking in public, here's a tip that worked for me. When someone with a volatile look on their face, very angry demeanour, and back then they weren't even jabbed because it's 2020, right? Steps up and says, eh, who do you think you are? You're talking fucking bollocks, right? Just hand them, hand them the microphone. Yes, sir, I may well be. You may have a, an opinion that's more valid and stronger than mine. Well, here's the mic. They ran a fucking mile every time. Never got, never got beaten up once. Never, never even came close. Obviously, if you're a woman, you're not going to get beaten up, but, you know... Well, no, actually, no, no, we, we've had Mama Bear in Kent got beaten up recently for, on the yellow board thing. So, have I, um, oh, three minutes, right, time to boil an egg, folks. Um, so, that's my, authentic, my authenticity continues by simply reporting what I'm observing, learning, reading, being told. That's all, it's very simple. Being authentic is extreme, and it also doesn't sap your energy because it's only the liars. If anyone's ever said to you, I can't come to them, I'm just too tired. That's the narcissistic liar because it's, they have to, it's, the lying is sapping their energy. When you're in truth, and I, I have this prodigious itiner itinerary that I'm just taking a breather from, if I were a narcissistic liar, I would not be able to do 10% of what I do. So, Another clue to authenticity is energy levels, depth of feeling, volume of voice. So many people talk like that. I don't think you can be saying the truth if you're talking like that, in my opinion. I can't dogmatise and generalise, but that's just my feeling. The truth is powerful. The truth is not that. It's powerful. It makes you want to sing, dance, shout, scream. And those New Agers, bless them, who tell you that anger is a terrible thing, that CIA mantra. Get angry. The mistake people make is to, is to retain the anger, go to bed with it. No, it's in the moment anger that makes you sing, shout, dance, scream. And when we're out there uh, as the Kemp resistance, some of us are angry, um, but the ones who are making, in my opinion, the mistake are showing the anger when they get challenged by the mainstreamers who are calling us names. So, use the anger, but don't let the anger use you, is what I'm trying to say. Anger is a beautiful thing, and for those who know psychology, anger is the feeling, and also the map of consciousness of David Hawkins, recently deceased, Anger lifts you out of despair. So if you look back at your schooling and are feeling anger, that is an amazing sign of progress. So you're going to start to channel that anger into countermeasures to retrieve your sovereignty, to retrieve your, to find your truth, your integrity, your authenticity. And sadly, Though it, it, it hurts to say, well, it doesn't hurt, but, you know, we have to face these truths. That even with the best will in the world, many of us are not leading authentic lives. And we're all, I'm no exception here. You know, I can be, I should be paying cash 100% of the time. I'm only at 90 odd percent. So that's, see? So we all have to keep self-evaluating and making positive adjustments continuously with our nutrition with our friendships, with our habits, with our thoughts. 
we're on a journey and we need to be self-responsible. So now bringing it back, okay, yes, we are eternal. Does that mean that the now doesn't matter? No, it matters because everything is connected to everything else. You are at cause. Yes, you are at cause. Nobody is causing you. I caused my own birth. I haven't got time to call, you know. It wasn't my mum and dad. Had, my parents had nothing to do with it. That's why my dad goes, oh, the hook is that when I was born? <laughs> had these golden curly locks, you know. And uh, my, my dad just went, that's not mine. I don't know whose it is. Who have you, who have you been seeing? Um, and my mum would have denied that I was hers, but she couldn't deny where I, my, my, my en entry uh, point. Uh, the only constant is change, so be the change. Be that constant. Changing is powerful. If your thoughts, feelings, words, actions are not evolving constantly, get alive. And if you haven't been arrested in the last three years, seriously, get alive. Because the shit is coming back and it's going to hit the fan much harder. So we're building resilience, not just authenticity. The, the key word, not just, I know this talk is about authenticity. The key word is resilience. It's that they're a good partnership. Authenticity goes hand in hand with resilience. One without the other. Yeah? Think about it. And there may be the third one, which is, you know, connection to reality. Well, that's authenticity in there. But um, certainly authenticity and resilience go hand in hand. Um, and what you put out, you get back. So if you're being kinder to yourself, and this again, my lived experience, I'm now much kinder to myself in every single way, so I have so much appreciation for what I do and who I am. It's so moving at times, I can't even, I can well up just even thinking about it. But it's authentic. I haven't, I haven't uh, artificially contrived it. It's just happened as I've stepped into my truth even more than I was before. Because the beauty of COVID, the gift that keeps on giving, is that it's removing the barriers to truth. It's removing the, 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 um, the blinkers are coming off. And it really is just the most amazing gift. But before we get the ultimate gift, we've got to deal with the ultimate curse, and that's coming soon. So... Just get yourselves resilient and authentic. You'll be fine. Um, right, I think my time is up. So thank you very much. And oh, if you want a book, um, they're 15 quid special offer because I like you. You've been a wonderful audience. Uh, and, um, and I also teach on a course, on online course, People's Lawyer, Universal Rights, Privacy and Universal Rights. That's, that's the only thing that I charge for. Well, no, the two things, the book, obviously, and the course. But if you want personal protection cards, child protection cards, come and see me during the weekend and I'll give you, hopefully you know what they're about. There's videos about them. Anyway, thank you and uh, see you over lunch and during the course of the weekend. <laughs>